Okay, so you finally made it after a whole semester of learning electromagnetics and what seems to be a bunch of disconnected topics, but in a somewhat relating, gotten to the end. We're at the end. Hopefully we should know a few things by now. And we're going to do a practice test. We're going to do a practice test over everything that we've gone over, all the videos, uh, all the topics we've gone over. If you see anything here that you're struggling with, you know, there's, I'm going to have a whole playlist of all the videos that I've made regarding this. Go, 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 go back and check it out. Check out some of the videos that are going to have a little more detail. I'm going to assume we generally kind of know how things are going. I've been doing practice tests, but this one uh, I've done in advance because of the number of questions and sort of the assumption that we should probably know this stuff by now, but okay, you got this, we're there, we can do it, let's go do it, okay. Okay, so first question, charges Q1 and Q2 are on the x-axis, so here we go, uh, and they have locations of A and 2A. For the net force on another charge at the origin to be zero, it must be true that, so we need to figure out some relation between the charges, and you could do this with forces, it's the same with electric field, so if the electric field is zero here, you put any other charge there, the force will be zero. It's essentially the same. So how will you do this? Okay, remember we can write the magnitude of electric field this way. If, you know, force, you just multiply by a second charge to get that magnitude. But the point is that when we add the two together at this point, they should equal zero. So that's what I'm gonna be saying. What At this point has to be equal to zero. And then we go and put in our information for these two things. And we have to be careful about the signs. I assumed um, the direction based on whether Q1 and Q2 are positive. So if they're positive, electric field will be going out like this. So each of them, you notice how the, the electric field would be going to the left. And so I called that negative. Again, it doesn't matter as long as they're going in the same direction. But the distance from uh, that point to Q1 is A, and the difference, distance between this and Q2 is 2A. So that's what we put in here. So what we need to do is go and solve. So we get rid of the Ks. Um, get rid of the case, and then we notice the difference here is we have an a down here and a 4a squared. So this 2, oh, I realized a mistake, just how I wrote it. So this should be squared here. So this 2 gets squared into the 4. We go and algebraically solve for that. We move q2 to the other side and divide out the 4 and all that other stuff. We get this relation, and we notice, okay, that's it. So it's saying that this charge has to be the opposite charge as this, which makes sense because you need one to be pointing this direction and one to be pointing that direction to cancel out and go to zero. And because this one's farther away, it has to be a lot stronger. Okay, hopefully it makes sense. Well, let's keep going. Okay, a little more of an involved one. We have a bunch of charges around here and we want to add up all of their electric fields together and figure out what is the electric field at this specific point. Again, we could choose any point, but we're gonna choose this one. So, you know, this ends up being a huge big sum. And because this is a 2D, we actually have to be paying attention to the X and Y directions. Again, we have the same magnitude for electric field, but we need to break it into X, essentially this big sum, because again, we're summing vectors. That's what we've been doing since last semester. So what we're doing in this semester, we have a bunch of electric fields, they're vectors. You have to break them in X and Y components or as many components as you need to do that. So. I did a little bit of a sneaky cheat move. Well, the thing is, you can pick any coordinate system and physics always has to work. It can't be based on all the rulers and measurements you put up. Physics just exists, well, you know, the world just exists, we don't try to describe it, but it happens regardless of how we set up our coordinates. So I chose a pretty convenient one. I chose one that goes like this. So that meant that getting an electric field from these two, I can just essentially make that the x-axis and for this one, these two, essentially the y. So you could do it other ways. You'll get the same answer, but it ends up being a little more problem. Okay, for the x axis, I really only need to consider a and c, and they could, you know, we can look at what happens with those. So we look at a. So this has a charge of 3q. Notice so they all have the same distance of a over square root of 2. So I already pre squared those. And since this is positive, this will be making a, an electric field that goes out from it. Hence, I give this positive because I'm considering the right here uh, in this downward right direction to be positive. Then we look at QC. So this one's negative, so the electric field's gonna be pointing in here. So this is also gonna be pointing to the down right also. So it's gonna be the same direction. Be careful with that. Same distance, but the charge is only Q. Okay, so that's what enters here. We fix the direction 
um, based off you know <laughs> what direction, uh, what point we're at, and what direction based on the negative or uh, the charge being positive or negative, which, which direction makes electric field. Ah, okay, so we add that together, end up being k. 8q over a squared. So you can notice, we can do the math for this one, but we can kind of notice that these two are likely going to cancel each other out. They're the same distance away and they're the same charge. So we can see how that plays out mathematically. Again, we're on our y-axis. These two don't really matter anymore. If we wanted to do it for this b, so it's this, again, this distance of a over squared of 2. That's what goes in here. It's a charge of q uh, minus q. So that means the electric field will be going in here. I'm considering up and to the right to be positive. That's what goes in here, positive. Okay, we go down to for this one. We get the same charge, same distance. You see that enters in here, but since this is negative, again, the electric field points inward towards it. So while this one had an electric field going up, this one has an electric field going down. So this one's gonna have a negative sign. And again, they're the same magnitude, so they cancel out. There is no y component here. Well, it's z equal to zero. So what is the total magnitude? Well, it's really just this x component, or if you want to do a Pythagorean theorem, you know, you do it with one of the sides being zero, you, do, you, you just get this component. And that is our answer here. Let's keep going. Okay. So we have a location A and a location B, and we have a charge here. Um, we're gonna be interested in the voltage, the electric potential created from this charge. This is how we write it down. And I realize it should be one, uh, not R squared, but R. Anyway, um, we wanna figure out things about the voltages at these two points. So notice, I'm gonna assume that we have, uh, you know, we, we actually don't know the charge of the particle, so we have to kind of infer that. But if it was positive, um, no, notice that this one is gonna have a larger electric potential than this, because this one is a lot closer, one over a smaller number, it's bigger and so it's going to be decreasing. And if it was negative, it would be the reverse, so it would be increasing. So we need to go look at these answers. Do they make sense? Okay, if the charge of the particle is negative, Vb minus Va is negative. So it's, if it's negative, um, the potential will be larger out here than in here. So this would actually be larger than this, so it'd be the, the you know, difference would be positive. So it's not this one. Okay, VB uh, is less than VA regardless of the sign, so that's not true. We talked about, again, it's whether you put a negative sign in here, it completely switches whether one is larger or not, so it can't be this one. Uh, VB is less than VA, we know the particle must be positively charged, so you notice this is essentially the anti-statement to this one, so, um, you know, if this one's wrong, then this one probably should be right, but if VB is less than VA, so if this is less than this one, we know it has to be positively charged, so that is true. So if it, it does look like this, where Q is positive, again, this one has to be a higher voltage because this is a smaller distance away, and then you go over to a large distance, it's gonna be smaller. But let's keep looking at the other answers just to see if they make sense. Okay, the sign of VB minus VA does not give us any information. That's not true. Again, we refuted that, talked about that before. The charge of the particle uh, is positive, VA is less than VB. This is just the same statement up here, except um, has this two things being reversed. So it's not that one, it's this one. Okay, let's keep going. Two equal charges of the Q are fixed at two vertices, so we keep the here, and essentially we take this charge and then we go and move it down here. And how much work, so how much, you know, on, on other words, how much energy we, did we need to give it for it to move down here? Because it's gonna be in a spot that's a little less comfortable um, um, it's like rolling, you know, trying to push a uh, ball uphill. You had to put an energy. It'd rather be at the bottom of the hill and roll it down. So it'd rather not be next to these two charges. It'd rather, you know, charges that are like sign, like to move away from each other. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, uh, change in work. I tr well, change in work is equal to the negative change in electric. Uh, well, yeah, electric potential. I was saying the right thing. So essentially what we're figuring out is what is the energy difference of it sitting here versus it sitting here? How much energy do I have to get it? Uh, in terms of it just you know sitting, existing, having a potential energy, we can write that down. You can write down the potential energy, the electric potential energy. Um, sometimes, you know, I think sometimes they're using PE instead, but uh, regardless as V times Q. So at this part two um, versus this part one is essentially what we're gonna be subtracting. 
So how do we figure out what's the electric uh, potential? Well, we uh, adding electric potentials from each of these is simple. You just add them. Um, it's not, I mean, vectors is easy too, but these are just numbers. So we don't have to really care about directionality or anything. We just go to look at our formula and put in our numbers. So what is going on at this spot? How far away is it from this charge? What's half of A? That's what goes into this distance. And it's a charge Q. That is the electric potential that's sitting there, you know, and then multiplied by this second cube I'm going to leave out because it's multiplying both of these terms. Um, and then the same thing for this charge. It's the same distance away. We don't really have to care about directionality where it's sitting in, re in relation just in terms of this distance. So you just have two of those terms. That is the electric potential sitting in that spot. And to get the electric potential energy, just multiply by the Q that is sitting in there. Okay, versus how much energy did I have before? Okay, well you do the same thing, except now you do it in this position. What, how far away is it away? Okay, now it's A and it's the same charges. So the only thing that changed was the distances, but otherwise it's the same thing. So poten the potential energy changed just because it got closer. Okay, we put this in. We notice we get two of these terms and this one we get a four out here because we get two of these terms, but we do this, you're dividing by two, we flip it up, we get an extra two. And when we subtract this out, this is the same term, except we have four here and two here, four minus two is two. And we see that that is an answer, that is our answer. Okay, let's keep moving on. Okay, now we have a Gauss's law problem, a negative point charge is sitting in here, then we have a shell with three Q. So we wanna figure out what the electric field is on this outside region. This is a perfect application of Gauss's law. Uh, we have this spherical symmet uh, symmetry where you can exploit it uh, and you can write Gauss's law in this really simplified form when you have the electric field always perpendicular to an imaginary Gaussian surface you draw around here. So when you can do that, sure, write it down. And then the question becomes very simple. What is the surface area of that Gaussian surface? Well, it's, we're drawing a sphere, so it's gonna be a surface area of a sphere. And then how much charge does enclose, uh, enclose, uh, enclosed? So we just need to count up all the charges inside. So surface area of a sphere, four pi r squared. How much charge are you enclosing? Well, you have to count everything. So we're in this outer region r greater than uh, r2, so r2 is here, right here. So we are enclosing 3q and negative q, so we need to add those together. 3q minus negative q is 2q. We go divide 4 pi r squared to the other side, we get 4 pi epsilon naught. Turns out that's just equal to k, so we just get k times 2q over r squared. And that's just one of the answers. It's, again, this is a problem that may seem really intimidating on the surface, but mathematically, I mean, this one is, especially you know, things like Gauss's law problems and we have an Ampere law uh, problem com coming later, maybe hard conceptually, but very simple mathematically. So we see this, hopefully it looks familiar. And as long as we know what region we are, again, if we were asked for here, the charge being closed would only be negative Q, wouldn't be three Q. So just be careful about that. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, consider resistors uh, R1 and R2 connected in series and parallel. So, and then the same battery, and then assuming they have the same resistance, R1, R1, and R2 and R2, but we've configured them so the equivalent resistance is gonna change. How does the power dissipated by these two resistors uh, compare? Well, we wanna write this in terms of resistance because we know the equivalent resistance changes when you arrange things in different ways, arrange resistors in different ways. The power in a circuit, well, on a resistor specifically, is the current going through it and the voltage over it, and using V equals I R, you can write it in terms of V and R. Why we wanna write it like this? Well, the voltage is gonna be the same, so each of these are not all gonna have the same voltage um, as each other, but if we turn this into one equivalent resistor, then we know that the uh, voltage over that is just gonna be of the battery. So that's true for both. So we write this in a situation where the voltage is the same, but the only thing that changes is the equivalent resistance. So then we just ask, you know, what has the smaller, uh, you know, resistance, you know, that's gonna have the larger power. So how do we calculate the equivalent resistance? Well, for things in series, you just add the two resistances. So it's gonna be R1 plus R2. For things in parallel, you do this one over rule. And it's not entirely obvious um, doing this immediately. Uh, again, this is kind of this inverse way of writing. I'm gonna write it in another way. Um, you can write it as one over, again, it's weird to write 
it's actually true that this is always going to be smaller than just the sum here. Um, it may not be entire obvi obvious why. Um, it might, be, not, might not be entirely obvious uh, why. Um, it maybe require putting a few numbers in and convincing yourself that that's true. If you put, say, they're just both equal to the same number, r, this would be r plus r equals 2r. You can sort of see what happens here. You get 1 over r plus 1 over r. So that means you would get 1 over 2r. Oh, shoot, no. 1 over, oh, this, this is hard to write, 1 over 2 over r. It turns out it's just r half. So in this case, if they have the same resistance, this would be r half, this would be 2r. So it's 1 fourth the, the, the uh, re equivalent resistance. So that's going to be the difference in power too. This one's going to have four times the power. So it just turns out this is generally true, this is, that if you put things in parallel, the equivalent resistance goes down. The electrons have more options to go, so they can go in a more optimal path. That there isn't as much resistance versus here. It's like, okay, I have to travel through multiple resistors. I don't want to do that, but I'm forced to. Here, I don't. I can just choose the most optimal path. So this one has a lower resistance, so it's going to have a higher power. So it's greater for the parallel connection. That's our answer. Okay, let's keep going. A parallel plate capacitor is charged by connecting it to a battery. If the battery is disconnected and the separation between the plates is increased, what will happen to the charge in the capacitor and the electric potential across it? So I didn't draw this situation, but you have um, something like this. You connect it to a battery, and then you uh, disconnect it, and then you've doubled the distance, or increased it in some way. So what happens? So you've broken the connection. Um, no longer will you necessarily have the same voltage because it's not connected to the same battery. But those charges are now kind of stuck in place. So the charges can't move. So the charge is going to remain constant. I want to use this one. The charge remains constant for all these. So all these that say it changes, they're stuck there. The charges want to move, but the, you're, when you're in a broken uh, circuit, charges aren't able to move. So the electric potential doesn't have to stay the same because it's not being enforced by a battery that's applying to it. So we can figure out what happens. Um, the charge stays constant. Okay, you know we have this fundamental relationship for capacitors VC. So what happens? We want to figure out what happens with the electric potential. So what happens with the capacitance? Well, when you go and uh, increase. Yeah, increase the separation. I'm doing it. You're going to um, decrease the the capacitance and look at and look at this here. So we have the you can calculate roughly the capacitance being this you know dielectric constant you know constant the surface area of a uh, <laughs> of a capacitor over the distance. So if you increase the distance, the it can't store as much. Well, I shouldn't say it's not necessarily it store as much charge, but the capacitance decreases. Um, you know, the essentially the, one of the explanations, the electric field between here is going to get generally weaker. Anyway, so the capacitance decreases by this equation. So the, the capacitance decreases here, but this is a constant. So if this is co a constant, this decreases, then this has to increase for it to be equal. It's a, saying this is an equal sign. These sides have to be balanced, stay balanced. This decreases, this increases. There we go. That's our answer. Okay, let's keep moving on. Okay, circuit shown, um, switch S is thrown to position A at time equals zero. So it's here, and then it switches down here. So nothing's going on in the circuit, and then suddenly things are actually able to move. You, we actually form a circuit, because you notice up here, uh, if we have no voltage and nothing going on there before, which I think that's the general assumption. Now we suddenly connect it to a battery. Things are able to move in this circuit here. We want to figure out what is the current at I0 through the circuit T0 and what's the current at in, uh, infinite time. So we can figure out a few of these pretty quickly. Um, this is an inductor. So it doesn't like change. Um, inductors oppose um, changes in voltage, changes in current. They don't like change. They're trying to prevent change from happening. So an inductor goes um, at t equals zero is basically a broken wire. So you know, essentially kills the circuit in initially. But as things die down, ends up just being 
essentially a normal wire with no you know, downside. It, it's just when it goes from nothing to something, it's a huge change, you know, change per, over time versus over a long period of time, nothing is changing. Okay, it doesn't actually care. So if it's a broken wire, there's no current going through. So notice that all of these are immediately wrong except the lat, you know, in this middle one. Um, and for t equals zero, um, essentially this just becomes a V equals IR circuit where the inductor isn't doing anything. So if you want to calculate the, the current, it's uh, going to look like this. It's just going to be V over R, uh, where instead of V, it's, you know, they write it as epsilon specifically, but you can sort of see you know, where that's coming from. It's that simple, really. It's that simple. This is a infinitely large change from going from having no current so uh, to some current, so when you, it's really a derivative working forward, but the change or, um, in current over the change in time is infinite. So it does an infinite resistance, blocks it, no current at first. Anyway, that's the logic for that one. You can go into a lot of math, but I think it's sort of beyond us at this point um, to do that for these kind of problems. We, let's just move on. Okay, let's do it. Okay, we're making good progress, doing good, doing great. Let's keep going. Okay, another problem, looks a little scary. Um, we didn't do st uh, too much of LC circuits, but again, something a situation where we have a circuit being formed down here, we have current going through here, and suddenly we switch it. So we've given this capacitor some type of energy, um, assuming that's been completely filled up and it's essentially killed, excuse me, essentially killed the current going through here. And then it wants to supply a current going up here. So we want to figure out what's the maximum current of the circuit. Oh yeah, and they say, you know, all of the specifics of this circuit and stuff. And yeah, sure. But what's the maximum current of the circuit up here? So this one, it's not super intuitive because we can't really do an Ohm's law sort of thing because we don't have a resistor and we don't have an understanding of what how what frequency these things will be moving back and forth. So we don't can't quite write down the impedance. But we can write down the energies. Um, why is that important? Well, the maximum current is going to be uh, regarded uh, happening when the, the inductor has the maximum amount of energy, has all the energy instead of the capacitor. They essentially are just going to be exchanging it back and forth. It's like a spring, um, you know, going up and down. At some point, it has a ton of kinetic energy. Um, at some point, it has a ton of potential energy, and it keeps switching back between uh, those two states. That's kind of what's going here. It's these two things are just going to be exchanging energy. It's going to be oscillating back forever, assuming there's no loss due to resistance. And you know, in reality, there are resistors that have wires, even if just a little bit, so they will kill it. But essentially, we can figure out how much energy this had at first, and then calculate later what the maximum energy would this have, and we can go uh, and get the current that way. So. Recall again, Q equals VC, but uh, recall that the energy in a capacitor is one half CV squared. So while this is when this is closed, this thing fully is stocked up with energy. It really is this one half CV squared, and that's for these two terms. So we know what C is, we know what V is. Those are both known. Okay, we close it. This immediately still has the same amount of energy, but now it's going to exchange it to here. We're told the inductance now. You know, we just need to solve for the current here. So we set the energies to be equal. equal the, it's the same energy, it's just being passed back and forth. We go and solve for I, we, move, we get rid of the halves. We divide by the L, put it over here, and then take a square root. We get 7.589. That is the answer. Okay, seems a little weird. Um, maybe a little not, not the most intuitive way to do it, but I don't really see many other ways. Let's keep moving, let's keep going. Okay, Okay. so we have a bunch of charges moving in a magnetic field and we want to rank them based on their uh, magnetic force. So we can look at you know the picture in a moment, but the, the equation we keep, should keep our mind is this F equals QVB sine theta. And this theta here is the angle between the magnetic field and the velocity it's moving. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's gonna be somewhat obvious um, for a number of these, you know, what the answer is going to be in comparison. For instance, we look at this one, and we know immediately that the force is going to be zero because the angle between the velocity uh, in the magnetic field is zero, and the sine of zero is zero. So this one is going to be 
dead last, <laughs> assuming, yeah, uh, I don't think any, none of the other ones are zero. So we can go and look at them. Let's look at A. So, <coughs> excuse me, we have QVB. Um, essentially, this is just a charge Q naught, a velocity V naught, and an magnetic field B. So this is our default vanilla one that we'll compare with. Then we look at B, and what's the difference? Well, <coughs> it's now having twice the velocity, so we get this extra two term here, but it's essentially just double what A is. So we know that B needs to be greater than A. So any of them where that's not true, it looks like, um, you know, for this first one, it's not, that one's definitely not true. Okay, for C, we have to think about it a little bit. It's got a few things going for it. It's got double the charge and double the velocity. So we put two extra twos in here, so it's gonna have a four, but it's at an angle. Um, so this is 45 degrees. Sine of 45 can be written as the square root of two over two. So this one over two kills one of these twos. So we get one of these twos and then the square root of two. That's what ends up here. So we look at this. We notice this one's actually the biggest. Two times the square root of two is larger than two. Again, they all share these base, you know, essentially what FA is. So it's gonna go FC is the biggest, then FB, then FA, then D. And we can see that is exactly what this answer is. C, B, A, and D, which is zero. Okay, that's our answer. Keep moving. We're making a good pace. I think we're somewhere around halfway, but let's keep going. Got this. Two parallel wires car carry opposite current as shown in the picture. Find the direction of the magnetic force felt by I2 due to the magnetic field from I1. So how do we do this? So, okay, we use the right-hand rule. We're gonna use it twice because there's two different right-hand rules. There's the one to figure out the direction of current being, well, direction of magnetic field created by a current. So uh, think about I1 in our minds. Um, it's creating a current going up. So this right-hand rule tells us that the, cur the, <laughs> the current's going up and then that the magnetic field is gonna be going around in this fashion. So we draw it on the picture. If we wanted to draw it in more of a 3D space, we'd keep going around and it's going behind. We can sort of visualize, that's a 3D effect. So <clears throat> when we go around, Again, it's wrapping around like his here coming out of the, the page. But when it gets to I2, it's going into the page. It's going down into it. So we know the magnetic field right at that second current. Then we need to use the second right-hand rule, which is, we. this is how I like to do it. I put my hand in the direction of the current. So this one would be down. I curl it uh, in the direction of the magnetic field. And then your thumb is telling you the direction of the electric force. So I put it down, I curl it into the page. And for me, that's telling me that it's to the right. So that is our answer. That is the whole problem. I mean, it's, you gotta keep track of both of the right-hand rules, but if you know them down pat, pff, you know, easy question done quickly. Let's keep going. This one looks scary. It's really not. Um, we have an enclosed uh, space turns a wire are wound in the direction as indicated on the hollow a plastic ring of radius R with circular cross section as in the figure below. And uh, if this current is in the wire is I, determine the magnetic field at the location indicated by X at the center of the cross section of the ring. This looks scary, but it's really, it's, it's, it's really Ampere's law, which is the magnetic uh, form of Gauss's law. You know, somewhere, I would say not exactly, it's the equivalent in terms of the spirit of how you calculate it. And what you do for Ampere's law is that you go in a direction and you enclose a surface um, and as you go around this you you do a, in reality you do a line integral but again just like the you know the Gauss's law we're going to be doing an approximation because because we're going to find that the magnetic field is always along the direction that we're moving and it simplifies uh, down to the magnetic field times the distance you travel the distance you traveled there would just be the circumference of a circle which is two pi big r and all we need to do is when we enclose the surface, count up how much current punctured our surface. So this is the I enclosed that goes through that. Um, I don't really care again what's going outside, but what punctured my 2D surface as I'm doing here. So you notice how all this current did. So we can count that up. It's I times the number of terms there are, turns there are. You know, you have all these little circles and they're all carrying I and they've all punctured it. So you just multiply n times i. And you solve for b, you move to, to uh, 
pi r over to the other side. I mean, and that's it. I mean, it looks scary, but if we're comfortable with Ampere's law, we know where that's coming from. You know, there's it. Okay, that's the answer. Let's keep going. <coughs> okay, an aluminum ring of radius five centimeters and resistance whatever is placed in there. So we have, okay, so we have a solenoid here. This is gonna be making a magnetic field and actually it's gonna be making a changing uh, magnetic field. And we're gonna be interested in this loop here. This one is gonna have a current being, well, it's gonna have some uh, magnetic field moving in here that's changing and it's gonna induce a current. So we're gonna be doing a magnetic induction problem. So we're doing magnetic induction, we have to write down Faraday's law, which is telling us that the EMF or the voltage being created in this secondary loop is equal to the number of turns in it. Okay, it's one turn. And this negative sign is just telling us it's posing the change. Um, but the change in the, the magnetic flux, which is really just the magnetic field times the area, it's really an integral, but uh, over the change in time. So you have to have a changing magnetic flux. Do you? Yes, well this one is gonna, we are told that it has gonna have a variable current. I have a variable current, this one's gonna be creating a magnetic field going through, and it's going to increase <coughs> if the current is increasing. So yeah, sure, we're gonna have, we're gonna have a uh, EMF created. Um, we actually eventually want to get the induced current, but you know, vehicles IR, you know, that's going to give us uh, almost the whole way. So essentially, we'll get this voltage, we'll put it into vehicles IR at the end. So we need to write out what were all these terms. Well, you know, there's one turn here, so we don't need to do anything more. Again, this one is just the one creating it. It's not the one actually having the induction in it, although it is uh, having induction. The loops are affecting each other, but that's not that's a different question. Okay. So what is the magnetic, uh, what is the magnetic, uh, not field, but what's the magnetic flux going through? What's the magnetic field times the area essentially for us? But notice how it's only this area. There's actually no magnetic field going through any of this outside region. It's just this coil. So we actually, when we put in the area here, we actually put in this smaller three centimeter one because that's the one generating the magnetic field. Okay. so. This is pi, pi r squared, that's covered by the three centimeters. What is the magnetic field created by the solenoid? Well, the magnetic field created by any solenoid is mu naught uh, small n i. So this i is current, constant, and this is the turns per meter. Um, you can have ter total turns, well, if they tell you the distance, then you can you know, divide it. But this is, they tell us, has a thousand turns per meter. Okay, and so we're not quite done. Because remember, we have to, this is sort of an operator, just like a negative sign is sitting out here. It's waiting to enter our terms and hit the thing that actually needs to be hit. Um, so what is changing here? It's, it's this, sitting, this is sitting outside and looking for what is actually changing. If none of things changing, this is all gonna go to zero. But they told us that the current in the solenoid is changing. So we actually have um, the current being a function of time. It gets hit by this delta. So we have this delta i over delta t. So this is the change in current over the change in time. Well, they told us what that is. It's 270 amps per second. That, you know, that's what we're gonna shove in, in the end, at the end. But again, just note there had to have been something changing. This is an operator that's coming around and sitting outside waiting for the right, ter uh, right term to hit. So maybe it was something else that was changing. Maybe it was the area that was changing and we are taking it and stretching or something. Yeah, but then we get to this point where we know all these terms we know what, what this n is, we put all these things in, we know it's the proper radius here. So we can get a number for the EMF, um, I just divided by R and uh, to, you know, using Ohm's law of equals IR and got the current. So it's just this one, 3.198 amps. Okay, let's keep going. We're moving, we're just moving, it's going well. We have a square loop of wire moving with constant speed and it's going to enter magnetic field. Which of the five graphs correctly shows the induced current I in the loop as a function of time? Excuse me. So note, again, this, this is a magnetic induction problem. So there has to be a changing magnetic flux. When is there a changing magnetic flux? Well, it's only when this loop is on this border. It's going, there's no magnetic field at all here, so there's no change. It's only when it enters this region where this, uh, as it's moving, uh, further, further, oh, I can't do that. It's moving further and further 
to the right, the number, amount of magnetic field going through it is increasing. The magnetic flux is increasing. So because that's going to be happening, we are going to have to have an induced current, an induced uh, EMF, you know, according to all the stuff we learned in the, la in the last problem. So we know it's going to have zero and then go to some amount um, because it's moving with a constant velocity. It's going to be a constant. So it's really not it really it's really not going to be in these triangle things it really has to be here is because um, just like in this problem this delta is going to come in it's going to hit you know essentially one of these instead of a r squared it's going to be a length over w and that's just going to turn into a velocity which is a number so it's just going to be a constant while it's in this region where it's only partially covered so why did i choose it's down here well what happens when it gets out here? So this is the region where the, it's going to also have magnetic. Uh, it's also going to have some mag magnetic induction, but it's gonna, from here, the the <laughs> amount of magnetic field is increasing. And when it gets to here, though, magnetic field is actually decreasing. The strength's not, but again, it's just the amount that's actually passing through the loop that we have to count. That's what matters in terms of the magnetic flux. So it goes from increasing and then goes from decreasing. Again, this is the change in magnetic flux over time. So if it's positive in one direction, and then it starts decreasing, it's gonna be negative. Because, you know, it's essentially a slope. So in one way it's gonna be positive, in the way it's gonna be negative. That's why the direction is gonna be sw switching. This slope switches directions, so it goes from positive, and now it's negative, and then a constant. Roughly, that's how you get that, you know, without doing a lot of math. Okay. Let's keep going. We're doing well. Uh, I think we've got a good pace going on. Match the physical situation with the maximal equation that sh would be useful in anal analyzing the situation. So we have all four of them, Gauss's law, Gauss's law of magnetism, which is not used very often, Faraday's law, which we just talked about. So we've done problems with each of these three, which I think are more of the mainstream ones, and this one is held for completeness. So we've actually done some of these ones, so we may be hopefully able to answer Find the magnetic field inside a, a current carrying coaxial cable. So that's Ampere's law. We use that for this long circular solenoid donut looking thing, but you can do it on basic stuff. You can prove that the magnetic field going through a, a, uh, wires mu naught i over two pi r using this exact same thing. That is Ampere's law. So that one's gonna be D. So we know we're looking for a D1. So we just basically got these two left. Predict the voltage measurement for an AC voltmeter whose leads encircle an AC carrying coil. So we just did a problem like that a little bit ago where we induced voltage uh, from one um, you know circuit to another. That's got to be Faraday's law. Yeah, when you're talking about encircling and changing, you know, yeah, that's got to be Faraday's law. So we are instantly know it's this one, but we'll keep going, at least for this next one. Fun the amount of charge inside the box. Hopefully we can recognize that has to be Gauss's law. When we're, we did a problem like that uh, near the beginning where we had these shells and we surrounded by our Gaussian surface. Alex asked how much current was inside. You know, you can do that, do it reverse. I said, I know how much electric field's going out or, or maybe the electric flux and then you can go and infer the amount of charge. Okay, that, that means three and A. So it's it's gotta be this one. And then, you know, we I think we, we're good at that point. Okay, let's keep going. Oh, this is a weird, little weird one. This one was fun though. Electromagnetic wave energy Q strikes and reflects off a block of initial momentum P block. What is the momentum of the block after the electromagnetic wave hits it? So that's right. Um, if you didn't know, light actually has energy and momentum. So light can go and hit things and impart momentum. So that's the idea of um, people talk about us having a solar sail, um, or if you put a, a, where you put a spaceship out in space and you have this huge area and the sun is actually putting pushing on it it turns out it's not very strong um, you know you can have these teeny little thrusters on that you put on just to correct moving on satellites and those are actually strong enough to you know counteract the the force that the sun pushes on I, I ended up writing a paper about it um, but this is a basically just going to turn into a problem similar to what we did likely last semester we're going to say that the momentum is conserved, meaning the momentum of both objects is equal to the momentum of both of them later. It's just, it exchanged it, just like when we talk about conservation energy, just switched from one form to the other. 
Okay, then what's the initial momentum? Well, you can get the energy, there's a relationship for energy and light um, by just multiplying by C. So essentially we go and do the backwards, we divide the energy by C to, to write out the momentum and we're told the energy is Q. So that's all I've written here. The light has momentum Q over C because that's what they told us. And I'm assuming the block has some momentum. We have no idea what it is, it's just some term. So how do I know that the momentum of the light is negative Q over C? So it's a reflection. So um, you have light coming in. I'm gonna use orange. It's coming in. It has a momentum of Q over C and then it reflects and it's going, it actually has not the same momentum because you have to care about the sign, but the same energy. And now it's just going in the opposite direction. You pick up a negative sign. And then we have the final one of the block. Oh, I just said block final. So how do you do that? Well, then you just add that to the other side. So you get whatever the initial momentum of the block had plus this extra two Q over C. So it turns out if you throw up, it's the same idea. If you throw a tennis ball against the wall, it bounces off in part it had a larger force versus if you threw a bunch of putty and it stuck to it. It's because it bounced off in this conservation of momentum. Okay, let's keep going. We're doing well. Okay, we have an optical qu uh, question. So this one, it, there's a lot of description up there. I'm just, I think the, the picture is better. So you have light coming down. It goes 1.2 meters uh, vertically, 2.4 meters horizontally. It hits water and then it bends. So this is gonna, this is gonna be Snell's law when you use it. We wanna figure out where does it hit the pool uh, at the bottom because we know light can bend in water and according to Snell's law. So this is gonna be Snell's law and a bit of geometry. So essentially what we do is figure out this angle, use Snell's law to relate these two angles and then use the last bit of geometry to figure out this distance and then add those two distances together. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we have a triangle here. We have this vertical uh, distance, we have this horizontal distance. Um, they're given to us, so we can just use the tangent, uh, or specifically the inverse tangent, to find this angle with the opposite over the adjacent here. That's what happened here. Then we get an angle of 63 degrees. Okay, so this angle is 63 degrees just from geometry. Then we use Snell's law. So I've written it a number of ways where you can simplify it to here, but if you solve for theta two, you get this expression where you just divide n to the other side and then take the inverse side, sine of, of both sides, you end up getting this thing. So we know all these numbers. N1 is just air, so that's all the stuff up here. The index of refraction of water is 1.33, that's what goes in here, and then we put in sine of, <coughs> excuse me, 63 degrees. Again, Snell's law is relating these these angles from the normal. So that's gonna tell us this angle here. So it's told us it's 42 degrees. Okay, 42 degrees. Then we can do the reverse trick of what we did up here, just do a little geometry. Um, we know the tangent of this angle is related to the opposite over the adjacent. So this x distance is what we want because we wanna find this total distance, we just add these two together. This is two meters, we're told that. We go and solve for that. Uh, solve for this x, multiply the two meters to the other side. This has to be 1.8 meters, uh, this distance here. So you just add these two, two together. 1.8 plus 2.4 is 4.2, and that's the answer, the closest one I have. Okay, that's it. Just a little bit of geometry. Be, a lot of these questions can look very scary, but typically the right solution is somewhat actually simple. Okay, let's get going. A screen is illuminated by monochromatic light whose wavelength is lambda as shown. The distance from the slit to the screen is L. At the fourth dark fringe of the screen, find the path length difference with respect to the wavelength lambda. So recall the path length distance is this d sine theta. This is what sort of we've been writing this whole time. And the reason we keep writing this equation, again, is that there's this, this one on the bottom travels this little teeny extra distance. Essentially, these two are parallel here. And that's what we care about. If that distance is um, equal to one wavelength, they're gonna still add up on top of each other. If it's equal to a half wavelength, they're going to destroy each other and annihilate each other. Because um, when you're just adding these two sine functions at the same time, and just depending how much they're offset, whether it determines whether they're constructive or destructive. So for destructive, the dark fringes, so the light annihilated each other, 
it's this n plus one half. So uh, this would be the n zero, this would be the n one, this would be n two, and this would be um, n equals three for the fourth fringe. So if you put n equals four, you know, get a little confused. Just note that the first one is actually n equals zero. So, you know, again, a little bit confusing here. But notice that the same thing is true. If we write this for the maxima, this would be n times lambda, and that would be a zero. So anyway, so it starts at zero. So like computer scientists. So we put in n equals zero. This whole thing is the path, extra path length. G sine, so all we need to do is write out what this is with three. So three plus one half, that's seven halves. That is the answer down here. Okay, that's all we have. You know, again, seems scary, maybe actually a pretty simple problem. Let's get going. You know, this one's a little tricky. I didn't think about this one. An object is placed between two meters, uh, mirrors set at an angle to each other. The location of the object of the, the image of the object. Okay, just looking at it. Okay, just look at the picture. I, I always get stuck in the words. So this one has a real object here. And for mirrors that are parallel, we're used to them. It's going to make an image that's an equal. This one's not equal distance exactly, but you know the real image would be down here. It just you know on the other side, we're probably used to using bathrooms a lot. It just makes an image, you know, straight across down here. So this makes an image. So remember, we've worked out a few problems with mirrors and uh, lenses, and we know that the image for one can be the object for the other. So that's essentially all we're asking. This image from this first mirror is now the object to the second mirror. So again, we just go straight across the same distance and we hit, the closest one we hit is three. We gotta be just very careful. So this is gonna be one of the images created. Now you can do this for all of these. You can go from this one and go to this mirror and then do this one and you'll find you make an image all the way over here. We're just asking for this one specific double image. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, I hope that matches our intuition with how mirrors work. Uh, these flat parallel. We have. I don't. I don't. I don't think we've talked about them too much, but hopefully we're ready for those sort of problems too. Okay, let's keep going. A real object is located to the left of a convergent lens. Here is our picture. The object's distance is 14 over 19 uh, focal lengths, and the, the lens's focal length f are shown in. So it's inside the focal length, and for convergent. Uh, uh, lenses, which are the focal length is positive. We know that the image is going to be not over here, but don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. So we have the optics equation. We can just throw the stuff in. We know the distance to the object, and we know the focal length that's f, and then we just relate it all to the you know, same baseline focal length. And then we can solve for this distance to the image. So that's what we do. We put in the distance to the object here, and notice again it gets flipped. It's 14f over 19. Uh, we can combine these two terms. I can subtract just the other side. So this would be 14 focal lengths, you know, you know, 14 over 14 focal length divided by, sorry, not divide, subtract by 19. 14 minus 19 is negative five. And then this is one over the distance. So we're gonna have to flip, you know, move everything to the other side, um, essentially flip this term. We get negative uh, 14 over five focal lengths. So it's 14 over 5, and we look at all these, 14 over 5, 14 over 5, that's all of them. But how do we know which one it is? So if it's, it's a negative distance for a lens, it's got to be on the same size. That is the, um, that's how, that's, that's the convention of lenses. It's the opposite for mirrors, um, where if it's negative, it would be, it would be, sorry, if it was negative, it would be on the other side. For lenses, if it's negative, it has to be on the same size side. So it's not the it's not either of these two. It has to be on the same side as the object. So is it flipped up or down? Well, it's not flipped down, and we can convince ourselves pretty quickly using some light rays. So what we know what's actually happening? Um, we uh, can draw a number of light rays. So this one goes parallel and then goes travels through the focal length. This one just goes in the middle unhindered. And we can't quite draw the other ones, but we can sort of see that these this is not going to be a real image. The light rays are diverging. It's not quite obvious that that's what's happening. But uh, yeah, I don't think for my I don't think my picture is helping. Let me try that one more time. 
hopefully we can see that they're diverging and they're, and they're not going to be going to the same spot, but we have to trace back. So it's a virtual image and it's certainly upright. And we can see that the point it converged, these two converge back, is certainly up and not down like this one over here. So it's got to be this one. That's one. it. Oh, and that's the last question. That's the last question. Oh, shoot. So that's the semester. Um, I hope that was enough. Uh, again, if you're struggling with anything specifically, I have an entire playlist of pretty much every sing single type of question and topic that was covered here. Go check it out. Make sure you work on the things that you know you're definitely weak in, because I, I guarantee probably all this stuff will come up. This is a practice test for, for... Okay. Um, Thank you all. I uh, really appreciate it following me on this journey. I know I'm going to be changing a bit of my stuff, but I hope whatever you're doing, whatever kind of exam you're working on, that it goes well, you do well, and you succeed and you reach your goals. I'm personally going to have some different content coming up. I think this concludes this whole series as far as I've been doing it. But as always, appreciate you all watching. I think it's great. I hope you learned something. Okay, bye.